end of the day, if you go on live stream, press go live. Yeah, this thing is all new to me. I've never live streamed off of YouTube before. All right, so for propagation, right? We want to somehow compute the output. The idea is really straightforward. Um, so neural networks, what exactly are we trying to learn? What is this machine learning thing we're trying to do? What we're trying to learn is this thing called the weight. So remember I said synapse, right? We're trying to learn the value of that synapse. And it'll be just the real scalar value. Um, so the value, and like I said, the value of each synaptic connection between neurons. Um, so just for some syntactical purposes, let's denote the ma weight matrix of layer k. So we'll call this layer k. Uh, that'll be layer 1, right? This will be layer 1. Um, let's call that uh, theta k. And then the way connecting the ith neuron in layer k to the jth neuron in layer, uh, uh, jth neuron in the k layer k plus 1 is uh, theta i j k, right? Does that make sense with everyone? So like, if I draw it out a bit more, so then all of these will just make up one matrix called theta i, uh, theta 1, right? But then the individual values, this, uh, x1 to h1 right here, will just be theta 1, 1, and then uh, superscript 1, right? Is that clear? And this will be just the, uh, theta 2, 1, and then 1, right? Very easy. And what's the goal for propagation? Um, given the input vector, so this input vector is just a regular vector. It's real valued, a bunch of scalars in a, stacked on top of each other. Uh, we want to yield a mapping theta, f theta kx. And the theta just represents that the network is a function of the weights, right? So the idea is we want to propagate x through the first set of weights, theta 1. Uh, denote the pre-activation values of layer i as h1. Now that might sound a little confusing right now, but what this really is, is, okay, so for this example, we want to calculate the value of h11, right? What is h11? It's just the value of x1 times theta11 plus x2 times theta21 plus x3 times theta31, right? So what you really have here is i equals to 1 it sums to 3 theta uh, I1 times S I, right? And that's exactly what we have up there. Does that make sense with everyone? If you guys, if anything's unclear, just feel free to speak up. And then you would do that for every single neural in the next layer, right? So you do the same thing for this. Uh, you just multiply uh, with all of the corresponding weights. Now, that's the pre-activation function, right? Um, successive weight matrix multiplied by the input adds will just be a linear transformation. So going back to this, if all of these is just a theta, right? If it's a theta weight matrix, then if you just apply theta after theta, you're, you're just essentially uh, doing a linear transformation. And that's not good. Uh, because a lot of data that we have in the real world is non-linearly separable. Um, so, th so that's why we come up with this thing called activation function. So remember when I said, oh, neurons can fire or they can't, right? This is the same idea. We're, we're essentially trying to filter out, uh, we're tr essentially trying to figure out which neurons are going to fire uh, when, OK? Um, and then the, the good thing about these activation functions is that they also allow us to calculate gradients, which is used for optimizing the weight values. So let us denote the activation function as a at, OK? And it just maps from real value to real scalar value. Um, what do you mean by non separable? separable. So like in this case, right? Um, if it's 2D and you have and you have like two classes, right? You can essentially just draw a straight line down the middle, right? Um, but you can't do the same for this. You can't just draw a straight line down the middle and then just classify the two classes. Yeah, this requires something like a circle instead. So that's what I really mean by nonlinearly separable. Um, you can think about it in like higher dimensions too. Okay, is that clear? Okay. All right. So the first commonly used activation function, this is what the what, very textbook one, is called the sigmoid activation function. And all it is is just equal to 1 over 1 plus e to the negative x. And then th if you calculate the derivative, it happens to be negative e to the negative x over 1 plus e to the negative x squared. Okay? And that, that's the same thing as saying a to the x uh, times 1 minus a to the x. You could do some multiplication, do some algebra, uh, you get that, right? And basically what it does, it compresses every single value between 0 and 1. Right? So you feed it in like negative infinity or something, it'll be zero. If you feed it something positive, really big, it'll be one. And anything in between is just, is, it's just continuous in between. 
And if you calculate the gradient, it will look something like this. It will be, it will be pretty much zero, um, past like four and negative four. Um, so what are some problems with this? This is idea called vanishing gradients. So what this means is that the gradients approach zero, resulting in almost no updates to the weights. Um, that's probably a little confusing right now, but once we go to optimization, you guys will understand what that means. Uh, the problem is that sigmoid switches these values between zero and one. And if you go to this picture, uh, the gradients here are pretty much zero, right? And that's, that's a big problem, as, as you guys will find out later, because you won't be able to update these weights after all. Um, so that means the gradients are larger and smaller at values approach zero. So like I said, no update to these weights. And because of that, they're not really used as the go-to activation function anymore. They're only used for cases where the values should be scaled between zero and one, uh, like for attention mechanisms, if you guys are curious. So what's the solution to that? Well, there's this thing called rectified linear units. It's basically a gate. Um, the equation for it is just uh, the mat of zero and x, right? If you think of it as anything uh, smaller than zero, it's just zero, and anything greater than, than zero is just the identity mapping, right? So if you feed in one, it's just an output one. If you feed in three, it's an output three. But if you feed in something like negative three, it's gonna be zero, right? So you're essentially just gating it, and you're just saying, oh, anything greater than zero, uh, we're just gonna uh, let, it, let it pass. And if you take the derivative, it's really easy to take the derivative. It's just the indicator function. So it's, it's just saying uh, it's one if it's greater than zero, and then it's zero if it's less than zero. And this happens to be a lot better, because now for like really large values, um, the gradient here is like no longer zero, so you're able to like uh, perform updates to those weights now, right? Nice and easy. So observe, uh, one thing you might notice is that ReLU is not a differentiable function, because the gradient at x equals to zero is undefined, right here, because if you approach from this side, it's equal to zero, but if you approach from this side, it's equal to one, right? Um, but that's not a problem because in, a lot, in machine learning, a lot of things are empirical. Uh, since it works so well empirically, we just define the gradient as at, at equal to zero at zero when we implement it, um, and it doesn't cause any problems. And we just use it because it works so well. Activation function, right. Um, activation function is basically saying, okay, so you're gonna have, in this example, right, you're gonna have like a real scalar value for all of these values, right? But you might not want to know all of the single values. You want to filter out some of them, right? Because like if you're classifying a cat or something, right? The idea is like, okay, some features might matter for a cat and you want to pass those on forward, but some might not. So the whole idea is that the, the activation function is actually filter out, filters out those features that aren't as important, right? And then the gradient is important because uh, once you go into optimization, you realize why it's important, but it helps you uh, compute the gradients and then you can update the weights from that. Okay. Oh, okay. How do how do you do that? <laughs> I trust, I trust <laughs> I have no judgment on this. Yeah, is that like a Zoom setting or something? OBS screaming in the room. Now is a great time to speak up. Oh, OBS. Okay, that's smart. Oh, true. Uh, view. No, it's definitely not this. Um, settings. Should, 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 uh, there's, there's like an option enter full screen. Is it? Add view. Or add view. Display no. capture. Or this. Full screen projector. Wait a minute. Oh. All right, can you shut the screen now? Whoa, that's that's really trippy. I'm assuming it's working then. Um, <laughs> Is it? I mean, after yeah, after the, the like the period delay, I should be able to see that. But we'll see. Tonight. All right, just interrupt me again if it doesn't work. Right. Yeah, don't worry. All right. Is Relum clear with everyone? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay, this is like the most commonly used one. You're gonna hear about this all the time. Um, yeah, so yeah, like I said, it's a differentiable. Now obviously there are some pros and cons. The pro is that it works well empirically. And the whole idea is there's more discriminability power as values are no longer compressed between zero and one. So like say now you're passing on the value of five, right? That might be, mean something different from passing forward the, the number 10, right? There's more uh, discriminability in that, in that sense. And now that's why it's like the go-to activation function for almost all tasks. And this fits the vanishing gradient issue that Sigmoid had. 
um, there's obviously some problems, and the main one is like the dying ReLU problem. Uh, so that means it only outputs zero for all inputs. So if you go back to this right here, uh, whenever you compute the pre-activation function, it's always gonna be less than zero, right? Um, and it's just gonna be equal to zero. But the gradient there is equal to zero, so that means your network won't be learning anything. Louder? Okay. Yeah, I'll try to be louder, I'm a little bit sick. Um, yeah. So that's why people propose many uh, variants of it, uh, like leaky relu, elu, and selu. Um, these are all the equations for it, I'm not gonna go over it. But as you can see, they do add some uh, gradients to it uh, if it's less than zero. And then if you see the empirical performance on uh, Cypher 10, uh, it seems that S relu performs the best, right? Because the training loss is the, the lowest. Um, but like, like I said, machine learning is like really empirical, so it put to totally depends on your data set and other factors. So it doesn't mean that, oh, if I use S cellu in every single scenario, I'm always gonna get better results than using ReLU, all right? All right, so now that we kinda know what activation functions are, now we wanna do, now we wanna <laughs> activate these features, right? Um, so the whole idea is we wanna apply an activation function, A adds on each uh, pre-activation value. And this is analogous to neurons firing. Uh, so let's, uh, let us denote the activation value of the jth neuron in layer M as AJM, okay? That's pretty clear. Um, and the whole intuition is that whether a neuron fires or not and the magnitude of its activation value is very useful in piecing together useful features features for accomplishing the task. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, and the extension is that unuseful features should be zeroed out by the activation function, right? So if you go back to here, it's really straightforward. All you really have to do is apply A to both sides And then you just apply A down here. And then that is now your A, A11 value, okay? Any questions? No, okay, moving on. And it turns out you could speed up this entire uh, forward propagation uh, process by using vectors and matrices. Because if you observe uh, what forward propagation really is, it's just a bunch of linear algebra uh, with non-linear functions. So these weight multiplications can be represented via matrix multiplication while applying activation functions to a vector matrix is the same thing as applying the activation function to each element of the vector and matrix independently, right? Does that make sense with everyone? All right, because when I was learning this, it kind of like bamboozled me. Um, so the whole idea is that it speeds up forward propagation. So let us write the forward propagation of the network v uh, below via vectorization. It's actually really simple, so I'm not gonna write it on the board. Um, we're going to denote some variables. So let theta1 uh, be a matrix uh, of size 4 by 3, uh, theta2 be a matrix of 4 by 4, and theta3 be a matrix of 1 by 4. So if you notice, what, what this is really saying is that um, the first number, uh, 4 by 3, right? The 4, it's the number of neurons in the next layer. And the 3 is the number of neurons in your previous layer, right? And then let x be a, a vector uh, in uh, R3. Uh, and bi be the bias term for layer i. So the output is really just this. It's theta, at, theta one x plus b, uh, and then you apply activation, uh, you do the same thing, you apply the weight matrix on the activations, uh, you apply another activation, and then that's how you really get to the end, right? That's how you get f of x. Uh, I didn't apply an activation on f of x. We usually denote it as sigmoid instead, or, or uh, we use like this symbol instead. Uh, and because you, sometimes you use something different. You either use a sigmoid or a softmax, right? We know what a sigmoid is, so, uh, but we don't know what a softmax is. So let me like, make the dif difference between uh, a sigmoid and a softmax. The whole idea of a sigmoid is that it scales each element of the vector and matrix in the range of zero and one, right? And the whole idea is like it's non-competitive. Um, so like I said, it's that value right there. And it's not a normalization with respect to the other values in the vector. So if you have something like this, let me get rid of the display link real quick. So if you have something like zero, zero, and zero, right? And if you apply sigma on it, you're gonna get 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and then 0 0.5, right? I, I just know that by the ba back of my hand. Uh, that's the value of it. This is sigma. But notice how this doesn't sum up to one, right? It sums up to whatever. 
Um, but if you apply a soft, uh, a soft mats on it, what you're really doing is you're really just normalizing it with respect to the other values. So you get something like 1 over 3, 1 over 3, 1 over 3, right? And you notice how this sums up to 1, right? The sum of this is equal to 1. So essentially what you did now is you kind of created a probability distribution. Um, this is used a lot, especially for uh, image classification. Um, yeah, and consequentially, it's kind of used as a confidence estimator. So like, maybe in the context of like image classification, if you're saying that, okay, this is a cat, this is a dog, and this is an airplane or something, uh, they all have equal chance of being uh, a cat, dog, and airplane, right? So you're saying there's a 33% chance it is a cat, 33% chance it's a dog, and so on and so forth. Question, question. Yeah. Uh, can you explain why not competitive in this thing? Competitive, right? So like, the whole idea of competitiveness is you're picking, if you look at the formula, uh, you're taking the e to the s of all these other values in there, right? So like, um, so it's e to the s, e to the s, e to the s. You'll notice that this will equal to, let's say, it'll be three, it'll be, it'll be three, right? Um, and then, if you take the, if you take it for just in the individual values, this is all, this is just one. Um, the whole idea of competitiveness is you're comparing with all the other values in there, right? But sigma, you apply independently to every single value in there, right? So there's no idea oh, of like comparing it with this or comparing it with that. So is that a little bit clear for you now? Perfect. Any other questions? And uh, I, I showed an example. Uh, I did this in uh, PyTorch. Uh, this is applying sigmoid, this is applying softmats to that tensor right there. And this actually does sum up to one if you want to run the numbers, right? So like in the context of like image classification, right? Um, you might say, oh, okay, it's probably whatever this class is because it has the highest probability of being that class. All right, loss functions. This is a really crucial idea. Um, now that you got an output, you want to essentially classify, oh, you want to kind of determine how raw is my model, right? Um, so that's why we use something called a loss function. And basically what it is, it's just a metric of how raw or how well your model per performed. And since the ground truth label is given in uh, supervised learning problems, uh, we can use that to compare with the output that our model produced, right? So uh, the whole goal of machine learning is, at the end of the day, is just to minimize the loss function. And to, an extension to that is different loss functions result in the model learning different, very different features. Um, and to give you an example at work, uh, I, used, I did some image segmentation stuff, right? And one of the loss functions I used was um, intersection over union. So like how much overlap uh, did my model produce over the ground truth? Um, and turns out if you use that versus a pixel-wise loss function, you learn very different features. So the first one is just calculating the variance of the model output against the target. Uh, this is just the variance formula. You're just, it, it's also called a mean square error. So you're saying, okay, ti is the ground truth label, right? And then yi is what your model, pr uh, your, what your model produced, and you're just taking the square, uh, sum it up, and then you divide it by m, right? So obviously, the more wrong your model is, the more higher j theta will be, right? That's here. Uh, turns out, uh, mean square error is actually not that great of a loss function. Um, so that's why we usually use something called cross entropy loss. It measures the error of a model given the output is between zero and one. So like the whole idea of why we use this is if you notice, uh, it has strong gradients as the loss diverges, uh, as the predicted probability diverges from the actual label, right? So like this might be a little confusing to understand, but say, uh, consider the case where ti is one, right? Um, so uh, t ti is one, this will be zero. So all we're saying is if we predicted something close to zero, then the loss is just gonna go up to infinity, right? And it turns out the gradient in this case is also very large. So that means you're gonna be performing bigger updates to your network. And that's the whole reason of why cross entropy loss is uh, much more preferred because the more w poorly your model performs or uh, the more wrong it predicts, the more greater of an update it has. So your model ends up training a lot faster because of that. So this brings us to the whole point of backpropagation. Uh, for some reason online, <coughs> online, uh, all of the resources that I, I saw, they overcomplicate this to like a, a funny extent. I don't know why they do it. Maybe it's just to show off that they know math. But this whole idea is actually really simple. Uh, when I was first learning this uh, through Andrew Ng, I didn't understand at all. 
but hopefully I can make it a little bit more intuitive. And the whole idea is of back propagation is you want to calculate the amount of error that every single one of these weight values made, right? Uh, and we call that the gradient. Uh, so yeah, how do we do back propagation? Well, let's, uh, let's, okay, so how do we, first of all, how do we reduce loss? Uh, one idea is to individually tweak each weight value. Um, so like, say we get some loss right here, right? Some value J theta right there. Um, and you want to improve that. What you could do is you could change the value of maybe this parameter right here. Change to something random, and you run the model again. If it performs better, you keep the change. If it doesn't, you change it even more, right? And you keep on doing that. But obviously, you don't want to brute force it, and um, it's not very feasible for multiple reasons. Regularly used models have tens of millions of parameters, so you're not going to sit there and change e every one of those 10 million parameters by yourself, right? Uh, so therefore, it's computationally infeasible. And also, the layered structure of neural networks makes it so a change to a weight value is not a univariate change. It is multivariate, right? So if you change the value up here, you're essentially changing the, uh, you're essentially changing everything up here because it's layered in a sense, right? You're feeding forward information. <laughs> so the whole idea is what if we can change uh, all the parameters at a time, at the same time, with some mathematical guarantee, and see if that improves the loss, rather than individual tweaking, right? So let's give us a toy example just to understand the main fundamental idea. So say we have a really simple three a neural network, X, Y, Z. Um, and Z is just known as uh, the activated value of theta X times X plus theta Y times Y, right? And you're given some error signal. Let's call it die J over die Z, right? That's the amount of error that Z had on the overall, uh, on, on the overall performance of the model. So the question now we want to ask is how do we calculate the error of Y and the X, given that we have the error of Z, right? Um, so we'll denote the error as die J over die X, the error of X, and die J at over die Y, the error of Y. So does anyone have any ideas of how we could do this? Um, turns out it's just calculus. It's actually really simple. All you really have to do is apply the chain rule. Um, so die J over die X is the same thing as just saying die Z, die J over die Z times die Z over die X, right? And you know X as a function of uh, you know z as a function of x, right? So all you really have to do is, we don't know this value, that's fine, but we know this value, right? We know, we, know, we know z, so we just take the derivative of z with respect to x. And what is that really? That's the same thing as saying the derivative of a here, right, times the derivative of theta x times x plus theta y times y with respect, with respect to x. So it's just this right here, right? So that's why you multiply with the theta x down right here. Is that clear with everyone? Any questions? No? Okay, and you can do the same thing with, uh, with y as well. So it's just die j over die y is the same as die j over die z times die z over die y, right? And then you get the same thing here, but it's just theta y down here now. Oh, I have the slides posted online if you want to follow along. Yeah, any questions? The j? j is the loss value, right? It's a loss function, right? We defined it earlier. Um, so. One observation you might make is that the algorithm is recursive, right? So you can do the same thing. So now that you know what die y, uh, die j over die y is, you can say that you can, you can calculate whatever is forwardly connected to a y now, right? You just apply the thing, same thing. So you're essentially just moving y here now, and now you know uh, now you can calculate the values of these that are connected to y, right? So you can just recursively find all of the error values of all these uh, neurons. Like that. All right, it's nice and simple. So assume the loss is cross entropy. Uh, find the error of A12 uh, for the network below. So we're ju we just want to calculate die J over die A12. So what you're doing is you're just calculating the error of this neuron right here. OK? So let, let's do that on the board for now. So we want to calculate the error of this, right? So what, what we want is we want to find die j over die a, a1, uh, 2, right? Let me make this part up. 
here. Well, what is this really? You can find die j of die a12. Well, one thing we do know is we're able to calculate this. So this is die j over die uh, y11. Uh, one, one. Right? So like we define y11 one, one equal to this. H1 of 4. Right? Is that clear with everyone? How I got that? Any questions? Right. So now we want to find the error with respect to that. So the error is just you plug this into the loss function, right? So we're using cost entropy. Um, you, you just apply this to the cost entropy function. I'm just going to leave this formula right now just to make it easier for us. Uh, so di j over di 1, 1, right? But notice how this neuron is connected to all of these neurons right here, right? And all of these neurons are connected to all of these neurons, this neuron right here. So that means this neuron right here has a direct impact on this neuron right here, right? Can everyone agree on that? And then we just say, okay, um, maybe we want something like this. Di 1, 1. Another question we could ask is, what's the error of each of these individual neurons on this, right? That's the same thing as saying die one, die one one uh, over die. Let's see, die a. Let's call it i, uh, i three, right? And we're gonna sum this. That's a really ugly sigma. But <laughs> i equals to one. Uh, we're gonna sum this over four, right? Because you have four neurons here. We're just applying the chain rule right here, right? Um, now you can do the same thing. So what's the, how much of an impact, it should be three, it should be three. How much in the, in the, of an impact did this neuron have on all of these, right? Well, that's the same thing as saying die A, I, three over die A, one, one. Right? And this is exactly what we want. Turns out if you multiply out everything, you get exactly this. Right? Um, so we don't have to calculate this. It's actually pretty easy to calculate. Uh, die. So this is the whole for formula for it. I'm just going to show you the answer just so we can speed it up a bit. Is there a problem with the string? Yeah. It's not fixed yet. But it's okay. not fixed yet. Yeah. All right. So it's this, right? So die j of die y. Uh, this is the cost entropy loss function. We just take the derivative of this with respect to y, right? Nice and simple, it's, it, it just ends up being this. Um, die y over die a, uh, they, die a i, uh, three, is the same thing as saying, you know that a, uh, you know that a i three is equal to uh, the activation of h i three, right? So you take the derivative of that. Uh, let's see, die y. So all you have to do is take the derivative of that with respect to die a i three. Um, the coefficient in front of the a i three term is just theta i one three. Uh, so you end up getting this, and you end up getting that. Um, so that's how you calculate all the gradients, right? So now you just multiply these all into here and then you end up getting the value of this, right? So you just substitute all of these values into here. Uh, you guys should look at it a little more independently. It was really hard to, for me to understand at first, uh, but that's fine. And notice if you use ReLU, the derivative is just zero or one. So what this really is, it's, it's just zero or one, right? So you're just, just saying, oh, did this activation have an impact on my value? If, it's, if it was zeroed out, then it has no impact, right? So this will just be zero. But if it's one, it will have an impact. So the derivative will just be uh, the weight value itself. So now that we know the value of die A1, uh, what is the value of die J uh, over die theta M1? So like, we know the value of this, right? Let's say we want to find the derivative, the value uh, with respect to theta now, right? Well, how do you do that? Well, you know, you know this already. Um, all you really do is just tag on the term Die a one one over die theta m one one right. So now now you have this die theta m one right. Can everyone see how I got that? 
All right, nice and simple. Right? And then we just know that it's just this. Um, because we know that we know that a1 1 equals to to the activation value of h1 1, right? And if you think the derivative of that with respect to theta m1, what's the coefficient in front of theta m1? Just remember that um, just remember it's like theta m1 times x m plus a bunch of other terms, right? So if you think of the derivative of this, you're just getting this value right here, right? So that's why you multiply this out, uh, and then... Wait, how, wait how, how do you op open this, this up? Because it's getting... OBS. OBS. Yeah, I, we, we, fu we found a way to do it. Sorry guys, there's a bit of... No, we, we need to... <laughs> this is, yes, this is... Okay, I think I... Should we just like cut the live stream? Sorry? Should we just like cut the yeah, live stream? Uh, yeah, we, yeah, do we just cut the live stream first? Or? Yeah. Uh, uh, do you know? Sweet. How should we cut? Wait, how, how should we cut the live stream? Yeah. Should we just like end it? Uh, I'm not too sure how to do it. Yes. Okay, but see like a lot of people are leaving. Is, is it just like you guys are busy or is like, is this too hard? <laughs> That's too difficult? Well, I mean, I have the slides posted. Uh, take some time to really understand it. It took me like a couple of months just to understand this whole idea, right? You're not gonna learn yeah. it in like the span of one hour, yeah, nice and easy. Even. Right? Oh, it's okay, though. Never mind, we'll just drop it. Just drop it? Yeah, open up OBS, maybe. Okay, it's okay. Is OBS not open right now? I have no idea what happened. Then we should just go back to the Yeah. All right, so now we got that. Um, is everyone still with me? It's fine if you're not. Like, I know it's really difficult, but... Um, so now that we got the, the error that each individual weight value has on the final prediction, uh, we use these gradients to optimize our model, okay? And turns out you could uh, also vectorize this algorithm so you don't have to like independently calculate the... Uh, die j over die theta for every single value. Uh, you, you do this, I'm not going to go over it, it's really confusing. Uh, but take some time to understand it, okay guys? Alright, optimization. Now that we calculate the gradient, how can we use these gradients to get our model to perform better, right? So what is the whole idea of optimization? The question that we want to ask is can we use these gradients to solve the optimization problem where we want to minimize the loss function, right? Because remember that the loss function is a, is a measure of error. We want to minimize the error that our model has. Um, so intuitively, we want to do some sort of gradient descent, right? And what exactly is gradient descent? Let's first get a rough idea of what a loss landscape is. So if you imagine if you have only two parameters, theta, theta, theta not, theta zero and theta one, right? And you plot the loss, you plot the loss value. Uh, of every single combination of theta zero and theta one, right? What you want is you want to find the minimum loss value, right? So it might be down here. So you want to find theta zero and theta one such that the loss is at a minimum. Is that clear with everyone? Well, obviously, uh, models don't just have two parameters. They have, they have like millions of parameters, but you should use this intuition to do the same thing. So the main idea of this thing called gradient descent is you want to move in the opposite direction of the gradient, right? So like, say uh, you calculate the gradient and it's going, and it's positive, right? That means there's something somewhere along this line right here, but you want to get to a minimum. Uh, since this is positive, you want to subtract, uh, you want to go that way, so you subtract a value, right? And the same thing, if, you're, if you calculate your gradient and it's negative, that means it's probably like around here, right? Um, so how do you get from here to here? Well, you also subtract the negative value to get to here. Is that clear with everyone? All right, cool. Um, and then you can also view this in level curves. I'm not going to go over this. Uh, and a disclaimer, the images used earlier were just to simplify the loss landscape. It's actually like a lot more complicated. This was from the paper visualizing lo the loss landscape of neural networks. Um, as very obviously, it's a very complicated system. Um, but yeah, 
That's and because it looks like this, uh, that's why training a neural network is so difficult uh, and sensitive to hyperparameters. So let's define some notation. Uh, so we know what theta is, right? It's just the weight values. And we know what f is. It's the function of the network parameters, right? So if you do f of x, that's just the output of our, uh, of our function, uh, of our network. So let us define v equals to the derivative of f, so the gradients of the network with respect to the loss function. That's the same thing as just saying this, which we already calculated earlier with a backpropagation, right? We calculated right there. Well, the first idea you could use is this thing called vanilla stochastic gradient descent. And what it is, it's, it's a first order optimization algorithm. So what does first order mean? That just means you're taking the derivative once, right? You're getting the first derivative of uh, the function. And the whole idea is you want to update our weights by subtracting the scaled gradient, right? So let us define a new value. Uh, it's a scalar. Let's call it the learning rate. And that, let's define that as alpha. This is essentially our scale factor. And it's also, in a sense, the step size that we want to take, right? So if you go back to the original, um, so look at the, look, at the, uh, look at the equations right here. All you're really doing is you're subtracting the gradients of it, right? Multiplied by alpha, right? And now that, that makes sense because if you go back to this picture right here, if you're right here, you have a positive gradient, you want to go down here. So, you, so theta is here, you want to go down here, right? So you just subtract the value to get down here. Is that clear with everyone? But now that raises the question, OK, that means alpha is really important, right? Because if alpha is too large, you might go from here all the way to over here. So that means you completely overshot the minimum. And that's not good, right? So that's why tuning hyperparameters is quite difficult. And it requires a lot of trial and error. All right? So like I said, uh, the, value of your, uh, the value of your weight at the next time step it's just the value of your weight at the, pr at the current time step minus uh, the derivative scaled, right? Is that clear? All right, so what's the main issue with vanilla stochastic gradient descent? Well, the main issue is that it's really sensitive to erratic updates and outliers in the data. And we want to uh, keep some sense of history when performing these updates. So like, let me draw you an example of what I really mean. Let's plot this as j, right? j of theta. And this down here is just theta, right? Consider the case where you have this. What if the, f what if the loss function looks like this, right? Um, and you're all the way right here. You want to get all the way down here, because this is the global minimum. This is the point where you minimize the loss function the most, right? So that's where you want to be, because you're making the least amount of error. Um, but what, what might happen is you might end up here, right? And you, or you might end up here, or anywhere along here, right? And you know that if you calculate the gradient here, then this is a negative gradient. So if you make, uh, if you make an update, you're subtracting the, 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 the gradient. You're subtracting the gradient, right? So you're essentially moving from here all the way down to here. Does that make sense? Now you're stuck in a global minimum and you can't get out. That's a really big problem because you want to end up here, but you ended up here, right? So, um, OK. Let's draw some, let's think about it for a bit. Can we draw some inspiration from somewhere else? Uh, yes, we can. Turns out in physics, there's this idea called momentum. So like, consider a ball being thrown. It gradually builds up momentum as it flies, right? And the momentum makes the ball less sensitive to direct forces, right? So if you throw a ball really fast, it might just break through a door or something, right? Even, door, even though the door is like uh, uh, opposing like direct force on it. So we could think of our ball as our point on the loss landscape, right? So imagine this as our ball, right? We want to be able to break through and go all the way down here, right? And then we can think of these gradients as the direct forces, because if you put the ball here, then the, there's going to be a force pushing it down to go here. But we want to oppose this force and then end up here, right? Is that clear? So we could use that as a source of inspiration. Um, now we define uh, stochastic gradient descent with momentum. So let's keep an exponentially weighted average of our previous gradients. Um, these are your previous gradients. It's recursively defined. 
right? So all you're doing is you're adding your new gradient to the term, keeping uh, the past gradients in mind, right? And now you just perform the same update, but with the past gradient now. So now what this gives you is something that looks like this. So now you'll, you'll be able to go from you'll be go, you'll be able to go from down here to here uh, to somewhere here to here because what is the gradient? Uh, the momentum vector was pointing this way, right? Or be able to push you all the way down here. That's the whole idea. And um, I don't know if I should go over this because like it seems like this is like really difficult. Is is this difficult for you guys? It's difficult. Okay, so huh? Just keep going. Oh, okay, fine. I guess. Um, so now, what? Now there's an edge case. What if the added momentum value uh, results in a very high loss, loss, right? So in the case of exploding gradients, you guys might not know what that means, but I'll explain it later. Um, let me show you a picture to to tell you guys what I mean. So suppose the case where um, the momentum vector is pointing this way, right? If you calculate the gradients first. Uh, and then you add the momentum vector at this point, then you're going to end up in a point like this, right? That's not really good. That's not what we want. We want to end up down here. But can we do better than that? Turns out you can. So what if we start here? First, make our momentum vector jump. So we jump all the way to here, and then we calculate the gradient uh, over here, right? Now, obviously, the curve here is a lot steeper, right? So that means the gradient vector will be a lot larger, right? Because the gradient vector, the magnitude is a lot larger, you'll be able to jump a little more. And if you just add these two vectors, you end up right here. And if you notice, the loss value right here is higher than right there. Right? So that's a good thing. So that, that's, why, that's what we call Nesterov stochastic gradient descent. It just basically means that you calculate the gradient after you do the momentum vector jump. Right? I just really take some time to understand that. Since we're talking, we're um, taking their graphical uh, intuitions. So, what if, let's say, um, there is no like such left bound on like the left side of the graph? Yeah. Would the momentum vector just send the data blank? Pretty much. Uh, what it really would do is it might send it to somewhere here, right? Uh, oh, but yeah, just let's say there's no like the like the graph doesn't yeah, exist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but now, now you find it here, right? Your theta is now at this point. So we just find the, the j theta, you compute j theta, it might be down here, it might be over here, whatever, right? And then you bring it down onto wherever j theta is. Then you calculate the gradient there. Is that clear? Okay. Um, so I guess like, he's just asking if you remove this side, right? Uh, will this just go flying? Uh, not really, because you're gonna, you're gonna make it jump, but then it's essentially gonna fall. Think of it as gravity, right? So like you're gonna fall to wherever j theta, where the slope is. Right, so like it might be sloping down here, and the point might be down here, so you might just fall all the way down to here, right? And you just cal calculate the gradient down there. Okay, uh, another question? question. Can you go over how the momentum vectors can calculate? Yeah, so it's with this equation right here. Um, this is the whole momentum term, so like this is the previous gradients that we had, right? So like we define beta one equal to something like 0 0.9, so that means like, oh, 90% of our, of our step our jump will be influenced by our previous uh, built-up gradients, and that's our momentum, right? And then uh, we're gonna add uh, our current gradient to it, right? So that's the whole, okay, this is the momentum part, this is our current gradient, this momentum part will shoot us somewhere, okay? What alpha do you choose? Um, okay, this is a really good question. You, you can have a whole course on it, honestly. Um, so with stochastic gradient descent, I guess a st safe choice is 0 0.01 or something like 0 0.001. That's usually a safe bet. And then from there, if your model performs poorly, you can adjust the higher low and then just keep on adjusting it from there until you get the best performance. All right, so this, this is the whole idea of like peaking ahead, right? You're calculating the gradient ahead after you make the momentum jump. So just visualizing this again, uh, this is our starting point. This is our ending point. So uh, you calculate the gradient here normally, and then you. Uh, this is the momentum vector here. You're gonna end up all the way here, right? It's just vector addition. Uh, but what Nesterov uh, momentum is? You first make the momentum jump, and then you calculate the gradient there, and that's gonna bring you down here, right? Nice and easy. Hopefully. No. Okay. Yeah. Like it took me a while to understand this as well.
Don't worry too much about it. And this is just the revised uh, formula for that. Don't worry too much about it. I think I'm gonna just skip a bit more just because it's it's a little bit hard. Um, if you don't worry, really understand. Don't worry about it. I think I should just skip everything <laughs> going forward. No, like it's 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 if, if this is difficult, then like the next few will be like even more difficult. So like, yeah, don't worry about it. You can read up about it all you want. The slides are posted. Um, the whole idea is that okay, next to the cast gradient is the set is good, right? Um, right here. It's, it's, like, it's like doing pretty well. Training cost is our loss function, right? That's what we want to minimize. And turns out that there's this optimizer called Adam, right? I talked about it in the slides previously. You can go read up about it. And in the code I provided you guys later, um, I have an implementation of it, so you guys can play around with it uh, and see how, how better it performs. Um, but notice how Adam performs a lot better than stochastic gradient descent with Nesterov and all these other optimization algorithms previously, right? And once again, this is something really empirical. Uh, it's not always the case. And I, I'm gonna skip this too. <laughs> You're definitely skipping this. Yeah, you don't. You guys don't want to touch this. Uh, okay. So uh, I talked about two uh, optimization algorithms previously, but I didn't like explain to you guys. But just to guys show you guys some re uh, results, I tested Adam versus Radom. The whole idea of Radom is you won't be tuning the learning rate anymore. Like I said earlier, you set the learning rate as something as like 0 0.01, or like 0 0.001, but tuning it is like a really difficult process, right? Uh, what these guys proposed actually came out two months ago, so it's like really recent research, right? They said, okay, let's get rid of that pretty much. And somehow it's able to do a lot better. So I calculated uh, on my data set for two different learning rates. These are drastically different, right? These are like or or uh, orders of magnitude different. Um, I use Adam and, and Radom and Adam, um, turns out, if you find the, the IOU at the, 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 the score at the final, final stage, um, for, for 0 0.00005 and 0 0.1, a learning rate of that, you end up with more or less the same value, right? Because if you take the delta of them, it's, it's, it's just this. But if you use two different learning rates with Adam, you get something much different, right? So this just shows you how important tuning the learning rate is. But if you use Radom, you won't have to tune it as much, right? So that's a tip moving forward. Use this thing called Radom, right? It's, it's pretty good, yeah. Can you explain what Radom is? Uh, I don't know if I, you guys want to. <laughs> it, it's, it's that, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not gonna go over it, but the whole idea is it gets rid of like, so this whole, this whole idea of like, there's a lot of variance in the gradient size, so you're, you're kind of jumping all over the place initially. Uh, they, they, they were able to normalize that, so, uh, every jump you make is more or less the same scale, right? Does that make sense? Because like some jumps you make, it might it might be huge. Some jumps you make, it might be small, and that's like just really uh, inefficient. Um, so like for for these values, you need a really small learning rate to scale it down, and for these values, you need a really high learning rate to boost it up, right? So you're taking more or less the same steps, and that's essentially what they came up with, with a little bit more, right? And and if you make these all the same size then it turns out it's a lot more stable when you're optimizing algorithms. It's pretty cool, like you guys can read the paper. I did not understand it the first time I read it, but it's kind of cool. Because at first I thought by multiplying some learning rate by just um, directly with the gradient, yeah. you're able to like slow down when you're reaching like some uh, local minimum. Yeah, but it, it's a lot more complicated than that. Like avoid a mistake? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's a lot more complicated than that. But yeah, that's the main idea. And yeah, they, they also showed that, uh, going back here, they also showed that um, if you use different learning rates for using stochastic gradient descent and Adam, you get very different results, right? Like these are the learning rates, 0 0.1, all the way down to 0 0.003. Um, the results are very different uh, compared to Radom, where you they converge at more or less the same accuracy at the end. So it just goes to show you that this works more or less. Um, and if you really don't want to tune your hyperparameter, uh, your, your learning rate, I guess just use Radom to optimize your algorithm. And I have an implementation of Radom in the code that you guys will be playing with later, so uh, feel free to play around with that. Now, regularization. Uh, so, say you have, a, not, not that you have a model train, right? But can it perform better than that? That's exactly what regularization is tackling. Um, so, 
there's this whole idea of underfitting and overfitting. The, uh, what underfitting is, uh, is that the model cannot capture the underlying trend in the data. So like, say your data points are like this, right? But what your model is, uh, what your model learns is a relationship like this. But that's not the exact relationship that you wanted to learn, because you wanted to learn something like this. You wanted to uh, learn a fit like this, right? Where it passes through pretty much all of the points. Uh, what overfitting is, is that um, the model fits the training data too close closely, right? Resulting in poor performance on the test data. So now you're essentially passing through every single point, right? So if you give it a new point that's never seen before, it's gonna perform very poorly because it overfitted on your training data, right? So that's the whole idea of what regularization is. Uh, regularization is tackling the problem of overfitting, right? And by doing that, uh, the performance on your test set, which is what really matters because you're applying that into the real world, right? The test set is, um, so like say you have a, like a self-driving car, it's nice to train it, right, on training data, but then you want to apply it on the real world. And uh, you don't want it to overfit, right? Because otherwise your car might crash into something. So um, yeah, that's why you use regularization techniques. Now there's one thing you should understand is that when you're training neural networks, it's usually done in batches. Um, this is kind of confusing at once. Uh, this is kind of confusing, but the whole idea is that you, mu you input multiple samples of your, from your data set at once, right? So like, instead of just feeding forward one image at a time, what you're doing is you're feeding forward four images at a time, or like 16 images at a time, right? So essentially what you're doing is you're running four different uh, neural networks in parallel, or four of the same neural networks in parallel, right? Is that clear? So like, if the batch size, we call this the batch size. So if the batch size is something like 64, you're essentially gonna have 64 of the same neural networks running in parallel, right? And each of them will have a different image inputted into them, right? And then they'll all be predicting different things. And the reason why you do this is it stabilizes optimization, because say one of these data uh, points, it gives you really noisy gradients and you, it puts you in the wrong place. But by doing it across all of these, you're taking the average of these gradients essentially, right? And then by doing that, it kind of tells you like a more holistic view of like where you want to end up. Right, because the gradients are considering all of these cases, not just one that just might be an outlier. Um, and yeah, by training in batches, it lets you use cool regularization techniques like batch normalization. So L1 and L2 regularization, uh, very common interview question uh, for data science positions. I, I got asked this for my position too. Um, so bridge regression, what you do is you just add the absolute value of all the weights, right? And essentially what you're doing is you don't want any one of these weight values to be too large. Because if it's too large, then it has too much of an influence on the result, right? You want to be able to piece together a bunch of small different features together uh, to construct one bigger picture. But if you have just one weight controlling everything, it's not going to do very well, right? Because you just think of it as a group project. Um, a group project does, it works out really well if every member contributes a little bit, right? And you guys end up with something really great together. But if it's, if it's just one member doing all the work, it's not gonna be great, right? Um, so that's the whole idea. You're penalizing the, the absolute value of the weights uh, compared to L2. This is L2, and you're, you're, uh, you're penalizing uh, the squared value of the weights. Um, there's a difference between the two. The first one is that it promotes sparsity. So it essentially gets rid of unnecessary weights, right? So it will zero out certain weights that it learned, oh, it's not that necessary, right? Uh, and that essentially reduces the number of parameters that your model has, which makes it really good uh, for feature selection. But it's unable to learn complex features because you have a lot less parameters to work with, right? Does that, is that, does that make sense? And what lasso regression is, or L2, is L, it prevents overfitting as well. Uh, it has one solution, but it's able to learn complex features because uh, it doesn't exactly zero out the weights. It just makes it really small, but it doesn't zero out these values, right? So with a bunch of these small little weight values, you're able to learn a much more bigger uh, bigger thing, right? Because you have a lot of small, think of it like a running a factory or something, right? You have a little bunch of little small workers working for you. You're able to produce something really good. Um, and uh, L1 has multiple solutions, while L2 has only one. Uh, feel free to talk to me later as to why that's the case. I'm not gonna go over it. Uh, why? Yeah. All right, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. <laughs> it's like there's only like so many of you, and then like you guys are probably like really curious at this point. 
Yeah, this is also, why is also a really common interview question. I got asked that too. And uh, yeah, this is something just good to know, I guess. So if you're taking the absolute value, right? So L1, L2, L2, L1, right? What is it really? You're taking the absolute value. It's just this, right? Compared to uh, W squared, which is just your weight value, which looks something like this. It's just a quadratic, right? Now, if you take the gradients of it, L2, because that's what you're really doing, right? You, you take the gradients of the cost function. You get something that looks like this. And once again, for this, if you take the gradients of this, it's just one here, and then negative, negative one right here, right? Now notice, like I said, uh, what this does is it zeroes out values. And it makes sense, because it doesn't matter if you're here or here, you're making the same update to the weights, right? On, on the same scale. So it's in a more or less eventually reached out here, where it becomes zero. Um, but if you do, if you go here, right? For really large values, the gradients would be really high, so you're gonna be making big changes. But then once you reach down here, the, the gradients are like pretty much approaching zero. So you're not making a lot of changes to the, uh, your weight values. So therefore, that's why, uh, while they do become really small, they don't become zero. So that's the whole reason why, um, why L1 promotes sparsity and then this one does not. All right, is that clear for you? And I have this whole talk prepared about uh, why there's one solution and then multiple, but feel free to talk to me after. Because it's a little complicated, but yeah. Uh, there's also this idea called dropout, which is also really good for overfitting. Uh, this, this idea is actually really simple. So at every iteration, what we define an iteration as, it's a forward pass and a backward pass, right? Nice and simple. Uh, backward pass meaning, oh, you calculate the gradients and you perform an update. So we define that as an iteration. So at every iteration, every single neuron in your network has a probability P of being dropped. So a probability P of being removed, right? So like in this case, it might be like, oh, P equals to 0 0.5. So we're saying at every single iteration, this neuron has a probability uh, 0 0.5 chance of being, 50% uh, chance of being removed. This one also has a 50% chance of being removed. So that pretty much reduces the capacity of your network by 50% at the end, right? So it's gonna end up looking something like this. Now, the whole reason why you do this is that it forces the model to learn more robust features with less parameters, right? Because a big reason why your model might overfit is because it has too many parameters. <coughs> Sorry. It has too many parameters that are able to pick up the noise and shortcuts in the training data that may not generalize as well, right? Because if you have too much, uh, if you have too much parameters, some of them might be like, oh, okay, let's pick up this feature, but it's actually not useful, right? So that's the whole idea. You're just trying to make the, you're trying to reduce the capacity of your network by making it smaller. Now, a question you might ask is if at every iteration you drop uh, random networks, or, uh, you, you drop random neurons, right? So that means uh, at every iteration, the, the model you have will be pretty much different, right? Because at some iteration, uh, this neuron might exist, and some at some iteration, this one might not exist, right? So when you're applying this to your test set, how exactly do you test it if you have multiple different neural networks, right? Um, so it turns out what you do is at, during test time when you're evaluating on your test set, uh, you use all your neurons, but you scale all of the activations by a factor of P. Just to account for the fact that, oh, like, if, if P equals to 0 0.5, right, that means 50% of your neurons were missing during training. Uh, but since you're obviously using all of these neurons now during testing, you just scale all of these by 0 0.5, just to account for the fact that some of them were missing, right? I guess that, that's a whole intuition. I'm still not kind of sold about that. There's not much mathematical uh, truth behind it, uh, but, but it works, right? And actually, it ends up working really well. So if you evaluate uh, dropout on MNIST, which is the handwritten digit uh, data set, uh, with, without dropout, the error rate converges at around 1.75%, but with dropout, it converges at pretty much 1%, right? So that's a really big boost. So it's able to generalize a lot better. And this was from the original paper by uh, a guy from UFT. Um, and this is whole idea, like, like I said, batch normalization. Um, I'll talk about it later. This looks really, really intimidating, but it's actually pretty easy. Uh, so it was originally hypothesized to combat internal covariate shift. So what does that mean? Internal covariate shift is like a change in the distribution of the input values, uh, variables during training and testing. Uh, so like, let me give you a concrete example. 
So like, say, say you have, you're, you're training your model, your, your, uh, your, your cat classifier on only orange cats, right? The distribution might look something like this, just for intuitive purposes, right? I'm just using distribution very loosely, but it might look something like this. But how about during test time, you start feeding it black cats, right? It's gonna follow the same distribution, but it'll be shifted because now it's a black cat. So it might end up all the way over here, right? What do you do? Your model learned uh, to classify this type of distribution, but it didn't learn to classify this type of distribution because it's shifted. Okay, so the values are different. Uh, what you really do is, all you do is just normalize this again, so it becomes, it essentially becomes like this. And uh, I guess uh, like that, that was what it was hypothesis, hypothesized as, but it was proven false last year. The math in the original paper was all wrong. Um, so yeah, don't go, don't go around saying that batch normalization uh, combats internal covariate shifts. Someone's gonna yell at you if they kind of know what they're doing. Uh, but the question is, why do we still use it? Uh, because it works so well, empirically. Uh, it's basically black magic, right? My boss even said that it was like, we don't know why it works, it just works really well and it's black magic. Um, so what you really do is, <coughs> like I said, you train neural networks in batches, right? You, you train them in parallel. So um, I guess I'll draw it out, draw it out just to make it easier for you guys. So like, suppose you have a network, a really simple network that looks like this, right? It's just three neurons. The batch size is three because you have three of them running in parallel. We know that these values are all the same, right? Or they're not the same, but these weight values are all the same. Yeah, the weights are the same. Um, so all you really have to do is for x1, x1, and x1, uh, let's just call this x1, uh, 1, x1, 2, x1, 3. So it's just the x value in the third batch, in the second batch, in the, fourth, uh, in the first batch. All you do is you compute the average of them. Right? How do you do that? It's really easy. You sum them up and divide by three. Right? And you also calculate the variance of them. Um, and with that, uh, after you have the the after you have the mean and the variance, uh, what you do is just you subtract the mean. So x one one minus mu over square plus x one. Right? This is just normalizing it. Right? So now it has like now half of these values will be below. Uh, a certain point, and then the other half will be above a certain point, right? That's, that's just what normalizing means. And once you take upper, more upper year uh, statistics class, you, you'll be more familiar with this. Uh, but yeah, it's really not that difficult. Uh, but you do add an epsilon term. You set this as something really small, like 10 to the negative 6. The whole reason why is you don't want to divide by 0, right? You don't want to divide by 0, and then that's just going to ruin everything. Uh, so yeah, that's why you just set an epsilon term just for numeric stability. And you do the same thing for all of these values, right? So you calculate the uh, mean and variance of this neuron specifically with respect to every, all of the same neurons in the same batch, right? And you do the same thing, and it normalizes the values. Uh, the problem is that once you, count, once you normalize these values, it might not be between zero and one, or it might not be between, it might not look like this, right? This is what a normal distribution looks like, right? Um, it's gonna be centered at zero, and then the variance will be one and one, right? So the size of this is just one, and the size of this is just one, right? And then this right here is just zero. Um, it might not look like this. It might look something like this. This is still normalized. So what you do is you tag on the term, you multiply it by gamma, and you add beta. And these are learnable parameters that will shift this distribution all the way here. So it's between like, uh, it's centered at zero, and then it has one unit variance, right? So you don't have to worry about it. Um, PyTorch, they do it automatically for you. So just know that if you, if you do like self dot uh, batch storm, it helps your model run. Uh, right, I'm, I'm not gonna go over this. You can read it yourselves. Uh, it's a little more complicated. And I gave some intuition on why it works. Uh, I think a lot of you guys are first years, right? Are you guys are first years? No, no, okay. Uh, well, you might know like uh, Taylor expansions and Hessians. Uh, you, you can read it if you want. Uh, try to understand it. I just gave some intuition on why it might work. Um, here we go. Uh, but the point is, if you look at this graph right here, this is from the original paper. So they trained the inception model, which is an uh, image model, right? Um, 
This is a regular vanilla inception model. This is how it performs. And it peaks at around slightly above 70% accuracy, right? But it turns out if you use batch norm with a batch size of 30, you end up here, right? And it converges at something like 75%, much faster than without batch norm, right? And it's now the whole reason is because now you're learning a function, right? You're learning a value between zero, one here, rather than the explicit raw pixel values, which might vary a lot, uh, especially with images, because the brightness might change, the contrast might change, there's a whole bunch of different factors, right? So now you're just learning a value in between here and there, it's really, it's much easier to do. And that's why it performs so much better. Now this is the more, like, no, no math anymore, so we're good. You guys, got all, you guys are done all the hard math stuff. Um, let's talk about some of the downsides of deep learning, because even though it's really hyped up right now, it's actually, you know, th there's some downsides of it. Um, <clears throat> so despite all the hype for non-vision and non-language tasks, so like anything without like um, image classification, image detection, and image modeling, so any task that's outside of that, neural networks actually do really poorly uh, compared to classical machine learning models. For example, decision trees, SGBoost. So if you go on Cato, do you guys know what Cato is? It's like a data, data competition website. It's like, it's like lead code for, for data scientists, right? It's kind of like that. Uh, but if you took a, take a look at the, and, and you could win money by, if you win a competition. So check it out. You might be able to pay your tuition with that. Um, if you take a look at the winners of non-vision and language Cato competitions, neural networks usually perform really poorly. The winners are usually something like more classical machine learning. And contrary to positive popular belief, you cannot just solve any problem by just throwing a neural network at it. So you can't just solve like world hunger by, oh, okay, let me apply a neural network at it. And boom, world hunger is done, right? It's not like that. And the second problem, it's not, inter not interpretable. And that's a really big problem for commercializing its usage. So like, you have all these neural networks, it's able to get the right answer, right? Like 90% of the time or something, but we don't know why. Like, why did, what features did it learn? Uh, why is it producing the right answer, right? And um, since I work in the hospital, uh, you can see why this is like a really big problem because say I train a model to detect lung cancer or something, right? And uh, you're, you're not gonna be able to commercialize this. The doctors won't be able to use it because not only do they wanna know, oh, this patient has lung cancer, they wanna know why he has lung cancer, right? You wanna know why. It's like, uh, what, if, what if my model was just wrong on the off case, right? And I said uh, he, has, he has lung cancer now. Well, now they're going to start the lung cancer treatment, and that's, that's a big problem, right? So they want to really see uh, what the model is learning, and uh, yeah, that's a really big problem for commercializing its, its usage, so it's, it's really still not used that much. And it's very easy to overfit your data's domain, uh, so domain adaptation is an active area of research. What I mean by domain is, uh, this is a picture from my supervisor's paper, recently published. Uh, so you have a bunch of these classes, so like ball, ads, clock, uh, but there's different domains, right? So one of these might be clip arts, uh, one of these might be sketches. They're, they're all the same objects, but they're, 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 they're drastically different in how they look, right? Um, so say you train a model to classify uh, these objects on just the sketches alone, and you try transferring it over, testing it on something like this. It's not gonna do well at all, right? So that's why it's very easy to over, overfit on your data's domain and not transfer it well. And the main reason why is because it doesn't learn the shapes of these objects, if you guys are curious. <coughs> Another downfall of, the, of uh, neural networks is that it's very fragile. There's this whole field of research called adversarial tasks, which the only job of the researchers is to break the neural network. They're, they're coming up with algorithms to break a neural network to make sure it produces something wrong. And there's actually a really funny uh, research, paper, research paper that came out last year so say you have an image, right? It has like something like 250 sits by 250 sits pixels. Um, they found out that the minimum number of pixels you need to change in that image, just like change the, the value of it, right? Um, it's just one. And that would completely fool the network. So you can see why like neural networks aren't very robust, right? Because if you're able to just change the pixel value of one pixel, it, it, it's, it's no longer classifying a cat as a cat. It might be classifying it as like a car or something. Right? And that's a really big problem. And uh, another, the last downside is a lot of research done is empirical with no theoretical guarantee. So like a lot of what we do is, oh, we think it might work, so we test it out. And then we come up with the math after just to like somehow back it up, right? And sometimes people don't even come up with the math after. They just say, okay, it works. Uh, it produced better scores, and then they publish it. 
So um, this is just a meme I found online. So like statistical learning is like they're using very big brain modeling techniques, right? Um, to combat their, their problems. But there's a common joke that used in ML is like, um, if your model isn't performing well, stack more layers, right? Add more neurons, right? But <laughs> you know, there's, there's no math behind it. And there's no guarantee it will work. So it's like really empirical. Now, let's talk about some reasons to be excited about machine learning, because I don't want to be a naysayer here. After all, what I do is machine learning, so I shouldn't be like talking bad about my own field. Um, OpenAI 5, really big news last year. It was able to beat, uh, it was actually able to beat the world champions of last year's Dota 2 tournament this year. And they, essentially what they did was they developed a general purpose learning system called Rapid. I'll show you guys a picture of what it looks like. Uh, they use LSTMs, PPO, I'll be talking about that a bit more in our reinforcement learning reading groups. Uh, but like, notice how much, much compute it took. It took 128,000 CPUs, right? And it took 256 P100 GPUs to train, right? P100 GPUs are not cheap. They're like 10K each, right? So like, that's how much compute power it just took to train a Dola 2 team, an artificial intelligent uh, Dola 2 team. And then now um, you, have, you have news <coughs> articles saying, oh, there's a killer AI from Elon Musk startup going to take over the world or something, right? I mean, sure, it sounds good on the news, but it's really not like that. But the point is, um, just the fact that we're able to do something like this is pretty remarkable. And this is the architecture they use. Yeah, um, it's pretty big. It's not just a P4 neural network that we talked about here, <laughs> right? Um, it's really complicated, but it's pretty cool. It just shows you how much work goes into this. Uh, I think last year, Google AI came up with this thing called BERT. It's basically a whole language modeling thing uh, mo language modeling uh, architecture they came up with, it's really hard to train. They trained them themselves. It took like months to train apparently. Apparently when training, it was even more damaging to the environment because of electricity usage than taking a round trip to Guatemala and back or something like that, right? So they used a lot of compute power, but now that it's trained, um, they black box it. You could, you could just use it up. You could use it in any of your NLP projects. Uh, most papers in NLP, they use BERT in some way or form nowadays. Um, I remember when Burke first came out, there's so many new papers published in that state on NLP. Because in NLP, there's, there was like a drought. No one could come up with something new that worked, right? Until Google AI was like, oh, have you tried Burt? Um, and then the next day, literally everyone published a paper on NLP because it worked so well, right? So now they just use this very black box. It's able to take any sentence, put it into a vector, and then from that, you're able to do whatever you want on top of that, right? So that's, that's the whole idea. And this is really exciting because this came out like about nine months ago. So it's all really recent stuff. And then you had um, this. It's, uh, I like to call it deep fakes. Um, it's pretty scary. Samson AI came up with this uh, back in May of this year. Uh, basically what you do is you feed a model a still image. So a still photo, like the Mona Lisa or something, right? And you also draw like the type of face you want it to make. And it turns out it's able to generate frames, like a video. So if you look at this video right here, it's pretty scary. So now the Mona Lisa is able to talk. Like, that is pretty scary. And all you did was really just feed it a picture and like a type of face you wanted to make. And now you're able to do things like this, right? So like now that the, you know, now that elections are coming around, you can see like this, will, this might be used in some way or form, especially with deep fakes and synthesized voices. So it's really scary stuff, right? But it just shows you, oh, it's kind of cool because we're actually doing things that are like not thought possible back then. And this is the model they use. They use something called a GAN, uh, more or less. So you feed in uh, the, the, the still image, and you feed in the landmark type of face you wanted to make, and it's able to generate the, the following frames from that. So it's pretty cool. Uh, so like one that's a little bit more relevant to me is Google AI back in, uh, I think it was May of this year, when I first started my co-op term. Uh, they published a paper in Nature Medicine uh, they, they came up with a model that was able to detect cancer even better than doctors. And then I was just there like, okay, I guess my job is done, right? Like, I don't have to do anything else. Like, they, they're doing better than doctors now. What more do I have to do? Um, but th that's a joke, obviously. But yeah, this is the whole model that they use. It was really complicated. Um, it's really cool, though. Can this model uh, tell why somebody has cancer or not? No, it can't tell why. That's the main problem with machine learning, like I said. It's not interpretable, right? So. This is neural networks, right? So all of these, <coughs> it's just a bunch of CNNs, which are convolutional neural networks. We might talk about it a bit later. Um, it's basically able to take in a bunch of images 
and then get an output from it, right? So this is all this is all the same idea as this. You you optimize it the same way. Uh, all of these algorithms you optimize it the same way, right? Um, so yeah, it's just really universal, which is really cool. And then more recently, I think like two or three weeks ago, OpenAI came up with this thing called uh, uh, hide and seek, where they had like three of these blue agents and three of these uh, red agents. The, the task was for these uh, red agents to find, uh, to play hide and seek with the blue agents. The blue agents had to hide, and the, three, uh, the red agents were the seekers. And this is the model they used. Um, it was really cool. You should search up the video. OpenAI has like some really good blog posts. Uh, and it was funny, because like, the red agents, they came up with really uh, cool techniques, like jumping on top of these bots to hop over, um, hop over these fences. So it's really cool. This is like in the field of reinforcement learning. We'll be talking about that in the reinforcement learning reading group. So definitely come on out. Uh, don't worry, it's not too complicated. We'll start uh, basic. Uh, but hopefully we'll end up somewhere doing something similar to this at the end. So I guess a brief intro to CNNs because that's what you guys will, will be working on later. Uh, CNN stands for convolutional neural networks, right? It's basically able to take in images now rather than just vectors, right? Vectors that pretty much don't really mean much if you just look at it. Um, so why do you use a CNN? The whole idea is weight sharing. I'll talk a little bit more about what it is, but images have features that might be universal across the entire image, right? So, it might, so you might have some weights that are able to detect uh, edges or like diagonal lines or something like that, right? And you want that to be applied across the entire image, right? You don't want it to just learn, oh, classify diagonal edges in this area if you were to just use a regular neural network, right? Because if you use a regular neural network, what you really do is you turn all of these pixels into one long vector, uh, one dimensional vector, and you feed it in, right? Some of these weights might be able to detect, detect an edge over here, but they won't be able to detect an edge over here, right? So that's the problem with classical neural networks. That's why you use this thing called kernel, which is basically a sliding window that uh, slides across here, and, and um, the whole idea is it's able to prevent translational invariance. What is translational invariance? Um, I provided an image. So like, say you use a classical neural network, right? Um, and it's, it's trained on just this image alone. It might be able to detect, uh, detect the cat, because the weights that correspond to this area <coughs> uh, were optimized to detect the cat, in the, if, it, if it was found in this area, right? But the moment you move the cat, slightly to the left, or to the right, or up and down, or whatever, now all that those weights see is something like this, right? All it sees is the cat's butt. Like, you can't classify a cat from that. Um, so that's why uh, you use convolutional neural networks, because regardless of where it is, it could be upside down, it could be inverted, um, it'll be able to detect a cat, because you're sharing the weights. You're, you're sliding a window across, rather than learning the explicit weight of every single pixel, right? Does that kind of make sense? <coughs> All right, cool. Um, yeah, so you guys want me to go over this? Because <laughs> we have a workshop on this soon, but okay. Um, there's this thing, let, let me just draw on the board. There's this thing called a kernel. I like to make this like, really simple, right? So, like, say you have a. Say you have a five by five image, right? This is your image, five by five image, right? What a kernel is, it's, it might be a three by three kernel, right? So it might look like this, right? So you remember these weights values that you had over here, like the theta one one, theta two one? All you're doing is you're putting these in here now. So these are your favorites, right? These are all distinct values right here, okay? And these are the values you're trying to learn. Try to learn the values in this matrix itself. And what you really do is all you do is you take this and do the element-wise multiplication, right? So at first, you might put it on top of here, this region right here. And for each of these values, you compute uh, the element-wise uh, uh, product. So like, it'll be like this times this, this times this, this times this. You do it for an entire window. And then you sum them all, right? And then from that, you get, you get the value in here, right? Nice and simple, right? And you see that if you slide it across the entire image, this one might be like something like a, it might be like a diagonal edge detector, right? Right, so if it's able to detect the diagonal edge over here, then it'll also be able to detect the diagonal edge over here, right? So that's why it's able to prevent translational invariance. 
So that's the whole idea of what it is. And pretty much the number of kernels you use, um, it's not exactly accurate, but uh, the number of kernels you use, so like an image is RGB, right? It has three channels. So an image might be like this. Um, so it has three channels. So you have 2D images stacked on top of each other pretty much, right? One might be red, one, one might be green, and one might be blue. Um, to get the number, so, so when, when you're playing around with the code, uh, what you're gonna notice, it's gonna say nm.com 2d and say three, right? Because you have three channels. Um, so you have three channels here, right? So say you want to expand the number of channels to something like 64. All you have to do is type in 64 here, right? And then what you do is you type in kernel size equal to three, right? So you use a three by two. Usually you use an odd number, right? Don't use five by five, that doesn't work. Uh, and one by one, you only use one by one to uh, essentially just shrink the number of channels or expand the number of channels, okay? And then you set this equal to three, right? Uh, I'll show you guys the code later, uh, but this is pretty much what you do. So that's the whole idea. It's just these parameters right here is just the number of channels in there, where the, where the depth of your model, okay? And from that, you're able to do things like pooling. Um, the idea of pooling is pretty simple. It's to shrink uh, the feature map. We call this a feature map, right? Uh, because it has a bunch of features we could, we could extract from. Um, what a feature map is, uh, no, what, what Matt's pooling is, is you slide another window, right? But this time, this window, it does not have weights that you learned. All you do is slide it across. Um, there's something called a Matt's pool. So you just get the maximum value inside this window right here. Right, so like say this is nine, everything else is like one or something. You just take this value right here. Well, there you go. That's your that, that's your that's the value of your next layer. So that's where the max pool is. And then the average pool, you just take the average within that window. Okay. Nice and easy. Are these used? Yeah. Uh so okay, so you have an image that's like normally images are not five by five, right? They're like something like two hundred fifty six by two hundred fifty six. But your model won't be able to learn like contextual information, right? Oh, it might be able I'm to saying, like specifically these, um, like the maps, maps right? with all like weights on them, or like how they are used. Oh, uh, okay. Um, you really just slide it across, and you just compute the the maximum or average within the slider window, the same way you would with the kernel, right? Um, and the reason why they're used is because you want to shrink the amount of information you have. I know that sounds weird, but you're essentially compressing more information into a smaller feature map, right? So something like this might be shrinking to this. But this is meaningful because now it's saying that, oh, if this feature is activated, that means there might be a car in this area or something, right? So you're getting more contextual information rather than the explicit pixel-wise information that you get from earlier stages. That's why you apply maps pools, average pools, just so we should get you know uh, more of the bigger picture, right? And that's really useful for things like classifying uh, images, right? Um, because like, if you're classifying a, a, a cat or something, uh, it might be like highly activated here or something, right? And it learned that if this feature uh, is, is highly activated here, that means there's a cat. That's the whole idea, okay? All right, connecting the dots, you might get something that looks like this. These are the linear layers that we already talked about earlier, um, and these are the convolutional layers. Just so that you can take an image, uh, turn it into some vector in some space that, in some like n-dimensional space that we know nothing about. Um, and then you'll be able to feed that. So that, that vector in, the, in between will have all the information you need to classify the image, right? So that vector itself tells you everything about the image you need to know. And all you really have to do here is just make the classification uh, of like, um, so like say you have two different vectors, you wanna say one's a cat, one's a dog, or something like that, okay? So that's why you feed it forward uh, through linear layers at the end. Does, does that make sense? All right, let's get coding, finally. Um, so if you guys are following the, the Google Slides, you can just copy and paste the link. But what we're gonna be playing around with today is the Cypher 10 image uh, classification data set. Um, so all of these images are 32 by 32 pixels wide. So you can run it on your, on your local computer, no problem. Um, uh, and the whole idea is Cypher 10, 10 stands for the number of classes there are. So like there's these classes, and you just want to be able to train a model that's able to detect, oh, uh, if you input this image, it's going to classify as a dog. Right? Nice and simple. So um, we have two options. If you guys have Python installed already, 
and you want to run, run it locally, so you have your own copy of the code, uh, you should do the, you should follow the instructions that run locally. Uh, and otherwise, if you if you don't, if your computer isn't strong enough, or you don't think it's strong enough, uh, or you don't have Python installed, or you just want to be lazy, uh, just follow that link. It goes to Google Colab with the code. You can play around with it. I'm gonna do both, okay? So let's first start with um, follow this link right here. I need to give you guys a chance to copy this link. Is everyone following? Let me let me just uh, set this up. Yeah. Okay. Um. Does anyone still need the link for this um, to be displayed? Or are we all good? All right, this is what Google Colab does. It has like CPUs and GPUs that you use. It's all on the cloud, so you don't have to worry about burning your computer. It's too small. Oh, true. Okay, nice and big, okay. Um, so this code right here is the random code I talked about earlier. It's not built into PyTorch yet because it came out two months ago. Uh, but if you want to use it, uh, just ignore this, okay? All this code, uh, just ignore the code. You don't have to work with this. Um, down here, the main file code is actually what you guys will be playing around with. I don't want to go back. Let's see. Oh, it's taking up. Is, but like, who who here is already on the Google Colab? Okay. Um, do you guys still need the link for it? All right. Um, okay. I'll assume you guys don't need the link. So, we're we're working with PyTorch, right? There's two languages that you know, normally use for deep learning: TensorFlow and PyTorch. I think PyTorch is way better. Um, some people might think differently. Uh, PyTorch is used for research mostly. Uh, so like if you do a lot of research, the code that you find on GitHub will be in PyTorch. So it's like really convenient to just use it. And the whole reason why people use it for research is like it's like break, broken down a lot more for you. It's not really black box, right? TensorFlow, what it's meant for, it's meant for production, right? It's meant for shipping products. So that's why they like already black box a lot of features that you can't really edit yourself. Um, so yeah. Uh, I guess to learn how to use how to do deep learning in the first place, I think start out with PyTorch. It's definitely like you, you get your hands a little more dirty. Um, so here, right, right here, right. This is what we. This is where we define our CNN. Okay. Um, like I said, uh, this is just a convolutional layer, uh, like over there. So I define three sits and five. I know I said don't use five by five kernels, but uh, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Um, so all this is saying is, okay, the first layer is like an RGB image, right? It has three, three, three channels, so like R, G, and B. Um, we're just going to empirically set the next number of layers to be sits, okay? So three sits, and we use a 5x5 five five kernel. That's all that means. Uh, that's all that means. And uh, by doing so, you already shrink your image by quite a bit. Um, then you're going to do a, a mats pooling layer, right? So you're sliding the window across, taking the maximum value, just so you get a little bit more of the contextual information. Uh, same thing, apply another convolutional layer. And then you have these linear layers, right? And that, that's exactly what we had earlier. So um, what this is, it's, it's just the number of neurons in your current layer uh, to the number of neurons in your next layer, right? So like in the example we had earlier, we had three neurons in the first layer, and we had four neurons in the next layer. So if we were trying to code up that example, it would just be uh, n in dot linear three four. Okay, <coughs> okay, nice and simple. Um, let's see. Okay, and this is where we define the whole flow of uh, our our tensors. So uh, et is the image that we have, right? We're gonna input et. We're gonna first pass it through the first convolution 
that you, you define up here, right? Then you're gonna activate it, right? Because if you don't activate it, then you're just doing a bunch of linear transformations. Um, we use ReLU, uh, that's our activation function of choice. You do a pooling, uh, and then you do the same thing. You do another convolution on it, uh, activation, and then pooling, right? And then now all this line is saying is, okay, now we have like a, some n by n, uh, n by n matrix, right? But how are you gonna feed that into uh, a linear neural network? We can't, right? So all we're gonna do is we're just gonna uh, turn the number of dimensions from n by n to uh, uh, a one-dimensional vector of length n by n, right? So you're taking a 2D image and turning it into a one-dimensional vector. Is that clear? Okay, cool. Um, now all you really have to do is just really pass forward the uh, feed it forward to the through the linear layers, uh, and then you get an output, right? Um, this is your data loader. It's gonna load up the data set for you. The good thing about Cipher 10, it's it's already built in to uh, PyTorch, so it does a lot of the things for you already. Uh, don't worry about it too, too much. You just have to run it. Uh, these are your optimizers. Um, I set I gave you guys the option to set parameters, uh, so you guys can choose between SGD, Atom, and Radom, right? Uh, play around with SGD and Radom and test around with like the learning rate. You can see like there might be a difference at the end. Uh, difference at the end. Uh, don't worry about too much. Don't worry too much about this. This is our, already like pre-written for you. Um, it works. So the thing about Google Colab is there's no such thing as like because uh, I know if you work in terminal, you could just like add the flag LR and then type in the learning rate, right? So if you want to change the learning rate on Google Colab, you explicitly have to go here and change the learning rate. So like, let's try like 0 0.5, ah, 0 0.5 or 0 0.5 or something like that, right? So all you're gonna do is you're gonna really define your hyperparameters. So like, um, so like the optimizer you use, I said it as random right now, but you might want to choose SGD, uh, whatever SGD, random, um, and beta one. You, you don't change these normally. Uh, and yeah. So Nesterov, let's set that as true, right? Because Nesterov sometimes performs a lot better, right? And then. Um, now that all of that is working, let's try running the code. So to run the code, all you really have to do is first, let's first compile this code first, right? Just in case we want to use Rabin. Uh, now that's compiling, should be done any minute. All right, it's, it's compiled, okay? Um, now all you have to do is you just have to press this play button right here. And this is gonna run the code here, hopefully. Yeah, it's gonna run the code here. And you can see it's downloading the data set from uh, a third party source online. And it should, be, it should start training soon. But yeah, any minute now. <laughs> right, so like, you notice how like uh, epoch, so what epoch is, it's basically one entire run through of your entire data set. So once it has seen all of the data points in your entire data set, we call that one epoch, right? And you just keep on running through your entire data set, uh, and you just keep on increasing the number of epochs from that. Uh, what we want to see is the loss decreasing, uh, because loss is the measure of error that your model produces, right? So hopefully it should, oh, I, I know why. It's because we set the learning rate too high. Uh, so let's first uh, change this up to random, actually and changes up to 0 0.01, because I know this worked earlier. All right, hopefully now we see the learning rate decrease. Um, but yeah, is there like any questions, feedback that you want to give to this workshop? Yeah? Uh, when it comes to creating batches, say if you have access to 10 training samples in total, yeah. is it a good idea to put all of your, uh, your entire training uh, data into one batch, or do you uh, separate batches? You could do that, but like if you have ten, I would advise oh, you should. Just, just an yeah. Um, no, don't do that. Normally, you, you want to match out like sixty four. So there's one there's this one data set called ImageNet. It has like millions of data uh, of of images, um, but the really good models they only peak at like if you set the batch size equal to sixty four, right? Anything higher, you need way more compute, right? Because you're running a bunch of neural networks in parallel. There's no way you're gonna be able to run like. A million neural networks in parallel, right? That's not feasible. That yeah, it doesn't work out, right? <laughs> okay, so now now it works, right? The loss is decreasing. So now we just say, oh, okay, it's learning something. That means we did something right, okay? Um, and that means the error is reducing. 
Okay, so I defined the number of epochs as 20 up here. You guys should change it. Um, if you have more time, you could change it to like 50, 100 or something. See how it pre performs. Uh, but if, if you say that as 20, I think once you evaluate on the test set, it's in a, it's in a get a accuracy around 62%, which is not bad. It's pretty good for, for this data set, especially. Um, but yeah, uh, that's about it. And we're just gonna let this run and just notice how the loss is decreasing, okay? And if you want a copy of this code, uh, you just you just, fo just follow these steps right here on my GitHub. Um, I guess the good thing about this is that it really gives you like an idea of what TensorFlow, not TensorFlow, PyTorch code looks like, um, so that you can just change some stuff up, change the data loader, and then apply your own data on it, right? It really gives you. Uh, I coded up a lot of this stuff so that you guys don't really have to worry about it later on, because I know when I first started with PyTorch, what I tried to do uh, was uh, I tried to implement everything from scratch. But <laughs> it took me like a month to just do that. And then after I did it, uh, I was started training my model. It had like 10% accuracy at best. I was like, okay, I'm never doing that again. I'm just gonna uh, rely on some, some code that already works out there and just modify it to my own data set, okay? So yeah, this gives you an idea of what Py, uh, PyTorch code looks like, what the syntax looks like. And I guess this is how you really get started with it. Is that what data scientists do? Just modify it? Yeah, that's pretty much what we do. Um, <laughs> A lot, no, a lot of what we do is we end up cleaning data. So like um, with these data sets, they're all competition data sets. They're already cleaned for you. Uh, but with a lot of real world data, there's a lot. Yeah, um, there's also like a lot of noise in it, right? Like some data, I might throw off your learning completely, right? Because there's nothing that you can learn from it. Um, so a lot of what we do is data cleaning because I work with images specifically. Loading up the 3D MRI images was pretty difficult because every time I worked with a new data set, I had to create a new data loader. Because like this right here, you just call a function, right? A data load, because it's already built in for you. Um, but when you're working with your own private data sets, then you kind of you kind of have to code it up yourself, and that will take like uh, some days at a time, just because you had a bunch of bugs here and there, and you just have to make sure you were you were loading it correctly, right? Uh, so yeah, a lot of what data science is, it's uh it's all about um, it's all about data cleaning. That's a really hard part, a really big part. And then there's also the side of data visualization, right? Cause like training is easy. You just sit here and then you just look at it, right? It's nice and pretty. Um, but then after that, you want to get some insight from it, right? You want to be able to plot it. You want to be able to get like, uh, you want to see why. There's there's a field of research, uh, like just trying to understand why neural networks work the way they are they do. Yesterday I went to a talk uh, at UFT uh, by this guy from OpenAI, and his team was doing a research specifically to understanding why a neural network learned the things it did or what it's learning. And it turns out with convolutional neural networks like this, it was able to learn useful features like edges or like the shapes of cats or something, which is pretty cool, right? Um, so yeah, uh, don't, uh, like de definitely like data science is not just sitting here and just looking at a model tree, right? That's a part of it, um, but, pardon? Matplotlib. Yeah, matplotlib too, but like a lot of what we do is the before and afters of this, right? Like this is just intermediate steps, so yeah. That's about it. Any other questions? All right, cool. Like, feel free to shoot me a text on Discord, Facebook. Um, I'll be happy to chat with you. Yeah. What's a data loader? A data loader. So it takes. So all your your data points are like PNG images, right? The data loader, what it does is, it turns that into a tensor, so like a matrix, like a NumPy array or something, right? So like a bunch of like values, um, and it also gives it a label with it. Right, so it's gonna say okay in your data in your data set. It's gonna be like um, everything in this folder is a cat. So what the data loader does is it loads up the images from that, and it loads up the fact the label as a cat, right? And it and it outputs that, and then you use that essentially, right? Because if you if you look at it here, you won't be able to see it. Actually, I have the same question. So yeah. What is a tensor? Is it just organized training data? Yeah, a tensor is just the matrix oh, of numbers, a real value number, right? So a tensor is just a fancy way of saying matrix. The thing about matrix is when we think about matrix, we usually think about two-dimensional matrices, right? So like something that looks like this. But the thing is, like in, uh, in like data science and stuff, sometimes you're working with like, like n-dimensional tensors or matrices. Um, what a tensor is, it's just, it's just a matrix. So like for, for like, this will be like a horizontal line or something, right? And the, the picture that this corresponds to would be something like this. 
right? So it's just putting this into the, uh, it's just finding the explicit pixel values of every single pixel. Okay. Right? It's just a matrix. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. If you guys worked with NumPy before, this is just a I NumPy array. Um, tensor is just the PyTorch equivalent of that. Yeah. So yeah, any other questions? All right, thank you guys so much for listening. I know there's not a lot of you guys. I think I went a little too in depth. But um, definitely like take a look at the slides because I definitely did skip a lot of stuff. And you're not gonna learn all, everything about deep learning in a day, right? So if you really wanna get invested in it, I pretty much gave you guys the entire Coursera course in the slides. Because um, I went through the course, right? A lot of the stuff you learned was pretty much useless. So I pretty much only like cherry picked the useful stuff. Uh, week five. Week, pardon? Week five. Yeah, I stopped at week five. <laughs> yeah, I stopped at week five. I don't remember what week five was, but it was pretty boring. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, so like share with your friends too if they're interested in deep, uh, deep learning or machine learning or anything. Um, share them the slides, you know, and we can really build a community from that. Thanks, guys. That was really good. Yeah. It was too complicated. <laughs> No, like you went, like that was like the best crash course I
kind of stop the screen, but we can clip the end. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Yes, everything ends.